Welcome to the Pitchworks Podcast. I'm Scott McTaggart. Over the last 20 years, I've been a sales rep, a marketer, a manager, an executive, a consultant, and an advisor. This show is designed to give you access to my list of contacts so that you can learn more about how to present your ideas at work and succeed in your career. Startups and salespeople, marketers and managers, from the Epicast Network in Pittsburgh, it's the Pitchworks Podcast. The fact is that for such a long time, we didn't need the world. The world came to us. Hey everybody, it's Scott. It's Wednesday and it's the Pitchworks Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. This week, Mark Santo is in the Pittsburgh Technology Council Studios up on the north side of Pittsburgh. We, uh, I don't know, we're bunking, I guess? Like, I uh, they have invited us into their fine new facility. It's in black and gold, the way you would expect, and, uh, and we do appreciate that. We're going to do a couple more of these from uh, this location, but let's talk a little bit about Mark. Mark is very well versed in the ways of the world. We're going to tap into his insights a little bit. The the things that he's done as general counsel for these huge corporations, as a, as a professor over at Duquesne University, he's going to tell us a little bit about the current state, what people are doing what's making certain people successful and how you can take some of those insights and put them to use for you. Before we jump into the show, I'm going to ask you to rate and review this fine program on iTunes. Just uh, get in there, give us a star rating and tell people why you think what you think. It helps other people to find the show and you know that's that's important for our growth and I would appreciate it if you do it. So let's talk to Mark. Let's find out about what's going on outside of the United States and uh, sort of how you can put that information to use for your your own business, your own practice. All right, coming to you from Nova Place, the new digs of the Pittsburgh Technology Council, Mark Santo. How are you, sir? Thank you, Scott. I'm doing well today. I don't know. It's weird doing this with a with a window, right? Yes. I yeah. kind of wish that we could do the Today Show thing where people would come in and like wave in. Yeah, and, right, you know, We right. could hello. say hello. They could have, you know, punchy little pun-based signs for us, you know, right. tell us how much they love Al Roker. Right. Um, so, Mark, you've done a lot of different things. I want to... I want to sort of set the table by saying today, if it's all right, I only want to focus on the bits of your expertise that are that are relevant to the international stuff, because that's that's something I think we haven't covered enough on the show. That's right. I'm an international uh, lawyer slash businessman. I like I would think that I'm more of a businessman than lawyer. In fact, every day I don't practice is a good day. Oh, yeah, I, I can imagine that it's high stakes. Yes. Is that fair? When you're when you're talking about law of any kind that isn't just contracts and you know like your your paperwork type you're worried about basically just having one shot at getting something right is that fair right well i mean the international context the the uh, when you're dealing in international business uh, the uh the challenge really is to create your own judicial system because in reality if you're a u.s company doing business in france or brazil or whatever there's an issue of what law applies right, right? i mean you're not in kansas anymore and the contract, I, I believe, is usually flawed. We love to believe that these contracts that we're signing are perfect, right? right I, I right. can't tell you how many contracts I've read over the years. And and it says like, well, you know, in case of a dispute, the law of wherever the the, right. the vendor is from usually will apply. And that's hardly the period at the end of that sentence. Am I right? Oh, you're absolutely right. Because the real issue in international business is enforceability. So if you have a contract that has um, that has two different nationals, say French and U.S., and you get into dispute, you know, does French law control, does U.S. law control, and will a U.S. court recognize a French judgment or a, will a French court recognize a U.S. judgment? So you really have to figure out, you know, you have to draft your contract in a manner at the end of the day it's enforceable. In the international context, that's why arbitration is so so prevalent because there is a treaty uh, that m- most of the countries around the world at least have signed, the Western countries, that basically ensure that courts of the two different countries, their nationals, if they agree to arbitrate, the co- courts of those two countries will enforce the arbitral award. Whereas in a judicial setting, there's no mechanism to enforce, to enforce a judgment. It's self-help. And so that's really why arbitration is such a much more pronounced and favorable uh, dispute resolution because everyone agreed to it. Yes, that makes sense. Right, but I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a couple things at you. Um, and as I understand, you teach at Duquesne. Yes, which by the way is no minor feat. Congratulations right. on that. Right. That's and a I, really good look. I must say it's an MBA class, not the law school. But right. still, I'm actually going to ask you a business class, a sure. business question, which is 
Do you think a lot of people are missing the boat by running away from the complexity of the international side of business? If I'm starting a company, mm-hmm. right now it seems the norm is, well, let's just do business within the U.S., right? But it seems like there's a lot more of them out there than there are here in the That's U.S., right. and right. we should be marketing to them. Right. But I, I'm, I'm curious. No, like, I, think you're, I think you're right. I think if you asked that question in the 90s or even early 2000s, it'd be, it'd be a different issue. But today, with the advent of the internet mm-hmm. and web websites, I mean, most marketing today, even the tech industrial sector, which I spend a lot of time with as a businessman, you know, the web is critical, your website. And so, you know, the fact that you can put your product, your technology, your solutions on the web, you automatically have a worldwide audience. So it's not unusual for someone in, say, the Ukraine to call you and say, hey, I saw, the, I saw your product or your solution on the web, and you know, I'm interested. How, do we, how can we do business? And then here you go. You're, you're international. It happens all the time. Speaking as someone who's started a few things, I've always been nervous. Like we, we talked about contracts. You know, that right. simple thing there, especially if it involves me shipping something right. out of the country, I do. I get nervous, but I wonder whether or not the, the higher risk leads to higher reward. Yeah, I mean, well, there's a gradual, the more risk, right, the, the higher the ward, but the greater the risk as well. Right, yeah. So the way uh, international business, if you look at it on, on a time continuum, a lot of U.S. companies that believe they have U.S. markets will actually start maybe with a, a foreign rep or a distributor, mm-hmm. right, that they don't have a presence yet overseas. They have a presence through another person, a rep or a distributor, right? And so their risk is lower because they don't have any capital invested in that foreign country. Okay. But maybe the next step is maybe your distributor's doing really well and you license your technology, your manufacturing to him. Well, now your risk just went up because now you have technology in a foreign country, right? And, but at the same time, you're getting more profits because now you got a royalty stream and consulting and so forth. And if you're doing really well, maybe you buy that rep or distributor you buy that. your licensing. Now you have full capital invested. You're a national of that. Your company is a national of that country. Yeah. But you have 100% profits. Now you have to understand in some countries, particularly developing countries around the world, you can't get 100%. Yeah. You may only get 49%. Or, or you know, so you're going to have to take, and they want you to take a local partner. This on. is the complexity I'm talking about, Mark. Like this is the stuff that's always made me a little nervous, right? right? And I'm not, it's not to say that it's insurmountable, right? Right. But I guess I don't know, as someone who is familiar with startups and and the early stages, what's a reasonable first step? Like, okay, so let's say Buzzy and I. Buzzy and I are in business now, and we're going to sell microphones. Why? Because it's what I have in my hand, and I don't have a great imagination. Right. Uh, Right. So we're going to sell microphones, and we want to sell them around the world, right? right? But there's just two of us. He builds them, and then I go around, and I carry a bag, and I try to get people to buy them, right? right? At that point, is it too early to start engaging somebody and talking to them about the the perils of international business? Should I just basically be selling in my own backyard to start with? No, my advice to you, first of all, uh, you know, you got a good product. We're assuming it's a very good microphone. Do you right? sound good? Yes. Okay. Well, in that case, Buzzy makes right. a great microphone. And, and you have a very vibrant web web presence, right? Okay. Yeah. Then my next advice to you is go to a trade show, an international trade show, the bot microphones. And trust yeah. me, they're there. Okay? Oh, yeah. And when you walk, you don't have to get a booth. You can walk the show and you will meet people who are maybe your reps, maybe your distributors, or maybe your partners. And I think international trade shows are a great way to understand that foreign market and mm-hmm. the international market for your product. I always before you spend big dollars. Yes, yes, that's cool. And I, the U.S. Commerce Department, believe it or not, um, has services that can help you assess that market. They have offices. Usually, the U.S. Commerce Department has reps in probably every Western country around the world and some developing countries, and those people are there to help you understand the market. That's really useful. I've always been interested in what can be done overseas. I think there are specific countries and specific parts of the world that are interested in some things I could ship over there. Right. But I largely believe that you do things the way you were taught, no matter how far you come after that. Right. Right. So if you were taught to basically like just own your backyard, then that's the play you're going to make for the majority of your career. That's right. Uh, your career, though, you've done a lot overseas. 
Italy in particular, yes. we talked about. Yes. Um, and one of the things, someone asked me, they said, you know, what was it like when you first sat down with Mark? Because you and I only met a couple right. weeks ago. Uh, what was it like when you first sat down with Mark? And I said, Mark says the word billions more than anyone else I've sat down with. Because you were telling me about some of the things that you've had success right. with. And you were like, oh, yeah, this company did $200 million when I got there. And then seven years later, got to $2 billion. Right. So that's right. And then you were talking about something that you were doing in Italy, and you're like, "Oh yeah, it's the fifth largest of its kind." That's right. And they do billions and billions. And right. it's like Mark is a guy who can use the word billions. So when people are listening to you, I want them to have that context. And you, you're welcome to fill in the blanks right. on that any way, any way you yeah. like. But there is tremendous opportunity. Yes. Yes. I, you know, I just happened to be very fortunate. I, uh, in my prior life, I was. Chief Counsel North America for Italy's largest defense group, aerospace group, and uh, and it's a, today it's the world's eighth largest aerospace group. But in the '90s, we took one of their divisions from 200 million to two billion in seven years. Took it public on a New York Stock Exchange, and then sold it to ABB, which is the world's largest engineering company, for you know several billion dollars. And at that point, uh, I exited as general counsel, went into the business world. Buzzy, I want credit. I've memorized every single one of those numbers, and the way he just recounted them means that I got them right. <laughs> right? That's right. I did it from memory. That's right. The iPad's not even on. Right. Like the right. the screensaver went on That's minutes right. ago. But the way we the way we uh, um, expanded so quickly is really through mergers and acquisitions. We probably did about thirty different deals in that span. In our largest acquisition, we bought Germany's largest uh, automation house for about seven hundred twenty million U.S. dollars, and that took us near two billion in revenue. But of course, we had a large checkbook. You know, our parent company was uh, one of the world's largest uh, defense groups. So, uh, you know, that made it easier. But yet, you know, along that span, that 10 year run that we had, you know, I really wanted to move out of law and into business because I was really intrigued of how you create value in an international setting. You've said that a couple of times. What is it about the law that you learned after you got done studying it that, that made it maybe lose its luster? Well, I mean, because I think when you're, you know, inside a business and you realize, you know, the drill is to continually create value, I think that's the hardest thing to do. And really in today's world, to me, like I, when I teach my MBA class, I tell them at the end of the day, I don't care what your position is, what you do, whether you're a supply chain manager or whether you're a, a, a you know, auditing manager, whatever it is, or whether you're the VP of sales, your job is to create value in that position. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, that's what really struck me when I went from a, in during that run up when we went you know, became a, a global second largest global industrial automation company was the was the drive the the uh, um, necessi necessity to cor continually create value, particularly when you're a public company. I mean, you, you live quarter by quarter, and you know it's very difficult to have that continuous innovation in, in value creation process. Many companies just can't get there. I, I also heard you kind of discount, you know, the accomplishments of the mergers and acquisitions and whatnot. You yeah. said, oh, well, you know, we had a big checkbook and those kinds right. of things, but that opens a conversation to international business also means international negotiation. That's right. Which is a minefield. That's right. If you've ever done anything with, right. with folks outside of the country, you realize that all of a sudden yeah. your, your norms and, and mores are different. Right. Uh, I have family members, for example, that set up shop in Germany for years. Right. right? And if right. you went into Germany with, a, with an American-style right. attitude towards not just business but negotiation, right, right. you – it would be wrong to think that you're going to come back with the same results that you would have back home. Right. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I mean, I've had the, the I've had the interesting experience of being consul to German, Italian, Chinese, and Japanese companies. The Germans are completely different from the Japanese. The Japanese are totally different from the Chinese. Uh, you know, and and so it, you know, the, it's really an understanding of their business mores, their culture. A lot of their, you know, and that's why I think it's very important before when you do business in a foreign country, not only to understand their political, their economic, their legal system, because then you're acutely aware of how that influences your bis the business. Do we sometimes lose track, though? You, you know, you made reference earlier to having a website that reaches those those right. buyers. Right. It's a lot easier to forget about those people when you're sitting at 
That's right. At home. You're at your home base. You're creating this website. Right. And you turn and you talk to the people around you. And you say, does this look good? Well, you've got an American right. viewpoint. You've got an American attitude. Right. And frankly, even if you do focus groups, it's unlikely to incorporate people that are overseas that might actually be, like you mentioned, China. China right. is massive. Right. China is flush with cash. And we're not taking them into consideration when we build our website to, to face the world. No, but I could tell you, now I'm going to insult the French here. Lingua franca is no longer the language of the world. English is the language of international business. Mm -hmm. And you will be, you'll be in the remotest part of the world doing business, and you'll be surprised someone there is going to talk English nine times out of ten. And so what does that mean? That means that doesn't mean that your website should not be culturally uh, diverse, it should be. Right. But you're not, you're, you know, you're in the game because you have an English website, period. You're in the, you're in the international marketplace, right? So now what happens if you start getting traction in a particular country, then you can start developing your website to that cultural and that, and moral, uh, you know, that, that cultural, uh, parameters in that, in that country. And then now you're really starting to penetrate that market. It's, it's funny though, when we get on the plane, we expect it to be a different experience, but when we're sitting at home, the, you know, right. building the website, we don't, right. we don't oh, really yeah. think about it. We're like, right. oh yeah, if right. we get, right. if we get a little bit from China, which has six times as many right. you know, right. uh, inhabitants right. as the U.S., That's right. That's right. Um, you know, along those lines, you spend a lot of time traveling. You have spent right. a lot of time traveling. Right. Um, and, and just, just the, the, the places that you mentioned, China, Japan, Italy, right. um, What's your impression right now in terms of sort of like the state of affairs, right? I mean, I think right now right. we're talking a lot about our entrepreneurial culture. Right. Uh, the U.S. is happy, I think, with the state of entrepreneurship. Um, but I, I have to ask you, like, if right. you were to compare with China, for example, which is a command and control economy, and right. I don't know, sometimes it's a little bit neater, a little bit cleaner, feels a little bit more organized. Well, here's what... Here's what I tell my MBA students. My observation from 30 years of working around the world is that what makes this country truly great, in the business realm, what's really great is that this, we're particularly adept and talented and skilled at dicing risk, slicing risk to the smallest, smallest point. As an example, we can take an idea in your head, right? Not even yet out in the world, we could take an idea price it and value it and finance it, right? Right. And that is an amazing, amazing, there's a market for that. There's an industry around that, yes. right? And what, what the rest of the world to a large extent lags behind is the ability to value and price risk at those finite levels. That's what we do. That's what Silicon Valley is, right? Mm -hmm. So what I've noticed, um, when you talk about China though, China, however, is actually very good at that as well. If you look at, if you look at the top ten companies by uh, market value, six or seven of them are U.S. Right, a lot of them are the Fangs, Facebook, Apple Network, you know, Netflix, so forth. However, when you go to the top 20, 12 are Chinese. Oh wow! Right, and so what you have, what we're in, right, Scott? From my view, what we're in right now is a battle between state capitalism, mm -hmm. which is the China model. Yeah. which is capitalism controlled by the state versus democratic capitalism, which is the West. And the problem is, is that, you know, China plays the long game and they're very, very smart. And despite the animosity between the two, our administration and, the, and China, um, I, I think China is in the long run uh, <laughs> very well positioned to, uh, to exceed our economy. Well, they, lot, they definitely have the manpower, ways. right? Right. Um, but here's, here's the difference, Scott, and, and, and this is a weakness of our government. If China says, I want, we're going to, we're going to spend $8 trillion in AI, guess what? They can do it because they don't have any check or balance. Yeah. They're playing with house money. Right. Okay. And so they put that money in that thing. Okay. Now in the United States, right, you have a system of government where the, if it, you don't have compromise, you have deadlock. And so we've spent over a decade now in strict deadlock where we can't even finance airports, roads, bridges. The problem with that trillion dollar bet is that it is still in fact a bet, right? right, right. I think one of the strengths of the U.S. economy is the fact that it is 
pre-diversified, right? right? Like right. Right. if you're going to make a trillion dollar bet, you better make sure it pays off. Right. And there right. have been empires throughout history where they bet on the wrong thing. That's right. And, and I think that one of the things that the U S is really good at is getting a bunch of people and some people are going to dismiss it as wasteful or, right. or chaotic or whatever. And I understand why, but they're not going to see that sort of iron sharpens iron. I'm going to go Mike Tomlin on you. Iron sharpens iron of these different competitive models, different ideas right. duking it out. Right. So China basically just waves a wand and says, we're going to have a trillion dollar bet. Right. They better damn well land the dismount, man, because otherwise they bet on the wrong thing. Meanwhile, we're going in a different direction based on a bunch of things that we cooked up in the lab that all Right. disagree with uh, each other uh, honestly right no what i'm what i'm basically saying is that the extent the u.s government is deadlocked and, and unable to really put the country in a position to be very competitively uh in f- terms of instructor mm-hmm. what you know uh internet uh, capability roads transportation and so forth they're hurting ourselves yes and china meanwhile doesn't have that political drag that 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 keeps them back, right? The other thing too, what really is a a big detriment to us is our immigration. Because when you think about it, take Silicon Valley. I haven't looked at this for a while. I did some work out there, of course, but one out of four companies in the Valley that go public are founded by foreigners. One out of two that are formed, just private companies have a foreigner involved, right? Mm -hmm. And so a lot of them have come here to study and so forth. But with our policies now, administration, right? Those people aren't coming here anymore, right? And so you're getting, you're getting very brilliant, brilliant people who are either deciding not to come to, for an MBA program. Maybe I go to Singapore for my MBA. Maybe I go to London, right? Because why should you come here if, I'm not gonna, if I can't stay afterwards? That's why people come to the States. They come here for the, for the ability to practice their skills, and, 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 and it contribute to the society. So to the extent that we are closed now, mm-hmm. that we're saying we don't want the Guatemalans, we don't want the Salvadorans, we don't want the people from the Mideast, right? All you're doing in the long run is crippling your own competitive you're sending, advantage. You're sending those people elsewhere right. to set up a life yeah, exactly. and, and take and take their, exactly. their unique brilliance you there. T- I, I talked to some, uh, some professors at CMU. All right? I mean, CMU is fantastic. Mm-hmm. I mean, the best software, you know, Software Institute, robotics, right? And they'll tell you they're worried about their, about their foreign participation because these, these foreigners who want to come here don't know if, they'll have a, if they can even come, number one or two, if they come, whether they can stay. I'm, I'm very – I run the risk of being your cheerleader, right? right? Like, I, like clapping over here is not one of the options because of the microphone, right? right. But the – I would like to take what you said and reframe it. And it's, mm-hmm. and it's like this. If we accept the fact that there are places in the rest of the world that people are trying to escape from, and escape is a strong word. So right. how about this? Right. Just Better life. They're, they're trying to leave and, and pick a destination. Right. Um, that is ultimately good for us, right? right? Because right. then we have the choice of who we want from all over the world and and they're coming here for a reason and here is if you want my very rough hewn theory on this subject it's this the reason that immigrants make great business owners is the fact that they are better at identifying opportunities because they're not as used to getting so many that's right right they take they can take advantage of, of an opportunity because there aren't as many where they're coming from. Right, right. Does that feel? Well, yeah, and the odds are completely stacked. They're the backs against the wall. So, I mean, they only have one way to go, and that's up. That's up. Now, the other side of that equation becomes, if you accept that and you say, okay, then after they've been here for a couple generations, you end up with a certain degree of inertia, entitlement, that, whatever. That's right. That's right. It feels like we should also be trying to work against that, too, that, right? Like that's how, right. How is it that we remobilize I mean, our, our young people to, be, to see opportunities the same way that maybe an immigrant would. Well, here's the starkest example, Japan, right? Okay. Japan is at a distinct competitive disadvantage because of their isolation and xenophobia. Yes. In terms, it's either you're either Japanese or not. You don't fit in. I've right? heard the same of Korea. Right. And so they don't have 
they don't have a sense of um, open. I mean, their borders are closed. Mm -hmm. uh, if you had to, if you had to start a company right now, and the U.S. wasn't a choice, where would you start a company? Good question. Let me say where I wouldn't. Right? Okay. I wouldn't do it in Southern Europe uh, because uh, their political and, and and economies are 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 basically hold back a lot of innovation. Okay. The UK's a mess with Brexit. Who knows what the hell's going to happen? I mean, uh, those people. <laughs> they are, don't know. <laughs> they're committing Herod Carey in front of our eyes. Um, you'd probably be in Asia, Singapore, China. Uh, that's where uh, maybe even Malaysia, Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Vietnam is, is spectacular in terms of its growth and its openness to, to business. So, um, you know, of course, I prefer the U.S. because I'm so, you know. That's, that's why I took it off the right. table, man. Right. But no, but I mean, that's where I think I would be. South America has problems. Brazil right now is really mired in a, uh, in a very difficult political uh, political situation. Indy would be interesting. Um, you know, in Indy, I think, is um, probably our best hedge against China in the long run. That's but interesting. Indi but India has, you know, enormous still pockets of poverty, but they have the human capital to compete with China. If, if you were trying, let's, again, I'm going to take something off the table. Mm -hmm. You're, you take China and India off the table, right? Mm -hmm. What's the place that you would want to sell a consumer good right now? I mean, you, the NAFTA region, despite Trump's uh, inability to kill it, right? In mm -hmm. fact, take Mercedes. When Mercedes-Benz looks at, you know, at North America, they don't even call it United States. They call it the NAFTA region. Right. right. Because Mercedes could put a plant in South Carolina, right? And that plant can has duty free rights to sell into Canada and Mexico, right? Yes. And, and that car may cross the border 500 times before it's done, right? Mm -hmm. So if you want to sell a consumer product, the NAFTA region is still your best bet because the United States and Canada, and to some extent Mexico, are very open, free, liberal societies, right. right? And business practices, right? So that would be my first choice. We have a lot of young people that listen to the show, mm -hmm. right? And I know a lot of them are wondering sort of with the world changing, mm -hmm. how should they prepare, right? How do they prepare for, for a, a Chinese economy that may take the number one slot? Mm -hmm. How should they prepare for maybe the tightening or loosening of what's happening across borders, right? Right. If I brought you somebody and I said, Mark, you're in total control of this person, right, right? Right, right. How would you prep that person for maximum effectiveness right. in their career? I, I just taught my last MBA class. I, I, I'm, my schedule's too uh, full to do it anymore. So here's the last thing I left with my students, right? I said, and this is my personal view, is that what we owe ourselves is to be citizens of the world. The fact is that for such a long time, we didn't need the world. The world came to us. Okay. That's different now. Okay. It's different. So to the extent most Americans don't have a passport, most Americans don't understand that there's a difference between Oman, O-M-A-N, and Oman, Jordan, right? Right. Uh, to the extent that they don't understand that Xi Jinping now is the leader for life and what the significance of that. You know, we cannot be an intelligent citizenry without understanding the world. You studied law. Yes. You teach an MBA. That's right. Which would you pick for that? Again, going back to our like right. ideal candidate, which would you tell that person to get? Would you tell them to, to specialize in the law, even if it's a specialized aspect of it, or would you tell them to get a business education? The law for me has always been a means to an end. And, you know, I much prefer the business world because there you can – you can create value. You can create employment. You can build great companies. And, and that, to me, that's, you know, I'm very happy. I'm very proud of the fact that I started a, a company last year, uh, a, a joint venture company that we just now have consummated a, a significant deal that will, that will bring us forward into the new year, you know, and that kind Congratulations. of what, what makes me tick. I'm glad for that. So, right. What's the name of that? The company is called DXT3. It's a it's an advanced optimization software for the midstream oil and gas industry, and we're merging with a company out of Houston called eSimulation Inc. Nice. And you said that that's gonna that's yeah. gonna be a big pop in, yeah, uh, in right. January, January for you. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think so. that's about the time that people are gonna be here in the episode. So uh, think of uh, Mark for a minute as you're listening to the show. That uh, the big deal is popping through, right. and it's helping him out with his right. 2019. Right. Um. 
One one last question, sure. sort of in terms of of preparing for, I don't know. Let's call it the next fifty years. Again, right. if you're getting ready for what what's coming next, right. um, from a languages perspective, is it Chinese? Is that the one you want to learn? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think it's, it's span, span. I mean, you know, we this country has going to have a significant percentage now of Latinos. Yes. And I, I think those two languages by far, of course, I prefer Italian. Mark, I appreciate you coming into the studio. Um, your insights are definitely appreciated. Good luck in the new year. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. All right. That's all the time we've got. Thanks for checking in with us. Uh, Mark Santo, thank you so much for your insights. Uh, there's a lot there that we can work with. I honestly think Mark ought to have a podcast of his own so he can talk about what's going on around the world and basically how it affects business. And I, I think everybody could, could get into that. Subscribe to the show if you haven't already. That way you get it before everybody else every Wednesday morning. Buzzy and I are going to make another one and you'll find it then. Catch you next week. The Pitchworks Podcast comes to you from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a production of the Epicast Network and McTaggart LLC. Engineering and production by Buzzy Torek and Nick Miller. For more information, show feedback, and ad sales, visit pitchworks.com. E I T C H W E R K S.com. On social media, find and follow the show on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram using that same brand name, P I T C H W E R K S. <laughs>